Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're going to do part one of two on the periodic table. Um, this lecture is going to be required that you have your periodic table nearby so that we can go over it. A few elements, such as gold and copper, have been known for thousands of years, since the ancient times. Yet only about 13 elements had been identified by the year 1700. As more were discovered, chemists realized that they needed a way to organize the elements. Chemists used the properties of elements to sort them into groups. In 1829, J.W. Doberiner arranged the elements into triads, which is groups of three elements with similar properties. One element in each triad had properties intermediate of the other two elements. By the mid-1800s, about 70 elements were known to exist. Dmitry Mendeleev, a Russian chemist and teacher, arranged the elements in order of increasing atomic mass. This was the first periodic table. He left blanks for yet undiscovered elements when they were discovered elements such as cobalt, nickel, and argon were found out that they had made good predictions. In 1913, Henry Moseley, a British physicist, arranged elements according to increasing atomic number. This is the arrangement we use today, and the symbol, atomic number, and mass were the basic items included in the standard periodic table, which you see here. When elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number, there is a periodic repetition of their physical and chemical properties. Horizontal rows, called periods, there are seven of those, and vertical columns, or groups or families, um, there are 18 of those. Groups share similar, similar physical and ke chemical properties, and groups are identified by number and letter, for example, 2A. There are three classes of the elements. Metals, which are electrical conductors, have luster, are ductile, and are malleable. Nonmetals, which are generally brittle and non-lustrous, are poor conductors of heat and electricities. Some are gases, such as oxygen, nitrogen, and chlorine, and some are brittle solids, like sulfur, and one is a fuming dark red liquid, which is bromine. And finally, metalloids border the dark, heavy stair step line on the two sides. The properties of metalloids are intermediate between the metals and the nonmetals. Some groups of elements have family names, like group 1A, the alkali metals. These form a base or alkali when reacting with water. They don't just dissolve, they react. Group 2A metals are known as the alkali earth metals because they form bases with water, but they don't dissolve well, which is why they're called the earth metals because they kind of make a muddy substance. And group 7A is known as the halogens, which means that they are salt forming. Elements can be sorted into four different groups based on their electron configurations. The noble gases, representative elements, transition metals, and inner transition metals. The noble gases are elements in groups 8A or group 18, depending on the periodic table that you're using. They were previously called the inert gases because they rarely take place in a reaction. They are extremely stable. They don't react under specific, uh, unless you're under very specific conditions. Noble gases have an electron configuration that has the outer S and P sublevels completely full. The representative elements are groups in 1A through 7A. They displayed a wide range of properties and are therefore good representatives. Some are metals or nonmetals or metalloids. Some are solid, others are gases or liquids. Their outer S and P or electron configurations are not filled. The transition metals are in the B columns of the periodic table. Electron configurations have the outer S sublevel full and is now filling the D sublevel. These elements are the transition between the metal area and the nonmetal area. Examples can be gold, copper, and silver. The inner transition metals are located below the main body of the table in two horizontal rows. 
Electron Configurations has the outer S sublevel full and is now filling the F sublevel. These were formerly called the rare earth elements, but it is not true because some are extremely abundant, and these include the lanthanide and actinide series. So here's an example. Group 1A are the alkali metals, but do not include hydrogen. Hydrogen is considered a nonmetal. Group 2A are the alkaline earth metals. Group 8A are the noble gases. Group 7A are the halogens. Do you notice any similarity in the configurations of these alkali metals? Well, if you take a look at it, the S1s are all 1s. They are partially filled, regardless of what level you're on. What about the noble gases? You'll see that the outer shells, or outer orbitals, are completely filled, regardless of what one you're on. You can see that some of these electron notations can get quite big. So the S1, S2, and helium are in the S blocks. Alkali metals all end in S1. Alkaline earth metals all end in S2. These really should include helium, but helium fits better in a different spot since helium has the properties of a noble gas and has a full outer level of electrons. It just only has the S as a possibility. Transition metals are in the D block. Please note the change in the configurations with the S1D5 and the S1D10 metals. I talked about that last lecture where they fill up the Ds first because of the lower energy levels so that it is fitting in with Hund's rule. The P block consists of all of the ones that are being filled in and these can include um, these are representative elements and they can include the noble gases um, they can include the halogens and the others and then the F block is considered the inner transition elements and those are the only times that you see the F block being filled so that's in periods 6 and 7 each row or period is the energy level for S and P orbitals. The D orbitals fill up in the levels one less than the period number. So the first D is 3D even though it's, on period, it's in period 4. 4D would be in 5 and 5D is in 6. I apologize for my row numbers, my period numbers. They're a little bit off. The F orbitals start filling at 4F and are two less than the period number. So we have 4F and 5F. 5F. All periodic trends are influenced by these three things, energy level, the cha charge on the nucleus, and the shielding effect. The energy level means that higher energy levels are further away from the nucleus. Charge on the nucleus, the number of protons, means that more charge pulls the electrons in closer because the positive and negatives attract. The shielding effect is also known as the blocking effect, and there will be more on that later. The energy levels and shielding effect have an effect on the group, but the charge on the nucleus has an effect on the period. So let's take a look at some of the group trends. As we increase the atomic number or go down a group, each atom has another energy level, so the atoms get bigger. The period trends, going from left to right across a period, the size gets smaller because of that nuclear charge. The electrons are in the same energy level, but there are increasing nuclear charges, so the outermost electrons are pulled in closer. That's why the atomic size gets smaller as you go across a period. Some compounds are composed of particles called ions. An ion is an atom or group of atoms that has a positive or negative charge. Atoms are neutral because the number of protons equals the number of electrons, but positive and negative ions are formed when the electrons are transferred, which means lost or gained between atoms. Men metals tend to lose electrons from their outer energy level. Sodium loses one, and there are now more protons, 11, than electrons, 10, and thus a positively charged particle is formed called a cation.
The charge is written as a, a number followed by an a plus sign, so it would be Na plus 1, or 1 plus, and is now named a sodium ion. Nonmetals tend to gain a, a one or more electrons. Chlorine will gain one electron. Protons, 17, no longer equal the electrons, 18. So a charge of negative 1, or Cl1 minus, is renamed the chloride ion. Negative ions are called anions. Okay, we're going to pick up part two of this lecture in the next set, and I will see you then. Thank you.